it a hack. It was a hack of the phone company. And these phone freaks got together and hacked into it, but it was for fun. It wasn't to steal money and that sort of thing. Eventually, Kevin got arrested for things on the Internet, and I got to know the man. He was doing it all for fun. White hat hack, white hat hacking, you might call. Almost all the hackers were, even in the early days of the Internet. We were just, I mean, the Internet didn't have our entire life, our financial security institutions. It didn't have our power grid, our transportation systems, everything in our life that's important, and now it does. And year by year by year, month by month by month, I notice there are more and more and more huge penetrations of data that we thought was kept private. And to me, cybersecurity is the most important issue in every single institution, every single type that there is right now. So I'm very glad for you to, I love coming and seeing um, Kevin's presentations. They're so interesting. And I hope you uh, walk away a little more educated from this. Now we're going to roll a video. Well, I, I feel like I'm being watched. That's because Kevin Mitnick is just about to let out of his keynote, Automation Nation 2016. He's been talking to the crowd about all sorts of security risks. Let's hear what the partners have to say. So he's, he's kind of throwing to the masses what some of us have kind of like played with quite a bit before. Kevin Mitnick's keynote was uh, fantastic, a little scary. Um, a lot of exploits that are out there that uh, you may not be aware of. I was impressed. Um, I'm still really concerned about the bad USB exploits. And this is called the bad USB attack. And what this does is it exploits the flaw in the controller in the controller firmware on the, on the USB, and I'm able to change this USB into an HID device to act as a keyboard to inject keystrokes to actually drop a malware payload. So I'm gonna show you how this works. It's really easy. So first of all, let me go over to the Mac here. Password's Kevin123 in case anybody was curious. <laughs> <laughs> and people always ask me for my password. And then I'll change it to one, two, three, four next month. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna bring up, let me make this larger. What you're looking at here is just what we call a Trojan listener. And basically it's gonna look for connections from compromised machines. It's a, it's a modified version of a tool called Dark Comment. And what it does is once a computer is infected, we're gonna see it pop up here. And then we're gonna see what control we have. You see, uh, you see the little icon for McAfee? Fully patched Windows 7. So we're gonna stick in the USB. And what I want you to do is pay attention to over up here on the attacker machine. This attacker machine is actually in London. It's not here, I'm uh, connected to it. And this machine is actually physically here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna you know, plug in the USB stick. And it's gonna pop up. And, and how do you get people to plug in a USB stick? Here, I'm gonna format it, by the way, make sure it's clean. And then I want you to pay attention and watch, watch the Windows machine because I have it timed. Usually you time it when there's idle time, when nobody's around, when somebody goes to lunch, they leave their office, and it will inject the keystrokes to drop a payload from the Internet. So just keep watching this. It should be about 15 seconds. It's set for 15 to 20 seconds, and it should pop up any second. There it goes. That's it. But that would happen, not immediately, of course, when I'm doing this demo, I do it right here in front of you. And in a second, we should see the Trojan pop up here. Give it a second. It takes, sometimes takes 20 seconds. And it's a root-kitted Trojan. There it is, right? So this machine isn't even in our building. This is in London. And this is a, this is a piece of malware you don't want on your system. Basically, if we look at the functionality of this, it's nothing special. You could upload and download files. You could, example, you could look at stored passwords. Let me show you that really quick. You could modify the registry. You could, um, you could turn somebody's laptop into a room bug. So if they're using a laptop, you can enable the microphone, capture the audio files, and then transfer those audio files at any time. So essentially it becomes a room bug. Now there's a, a password there to VPN, CBIT rocks. I don't know if you can see that, it's kind of small. Okay. And uh, the coolest one that I like, one of my favorites, uh, second, 
is the spy functions again where you, this is webcam, so you can turn on some of these webcam. In fact, one of the CBIT employees back there, there's only one guy that has tape over his webcam, so I had to laugh, right? He's probably thinking of me. Right? So I turn on the webcam, and again, this is, you know, in London, so there's uh, probably going to be some latency here. And over here, this light pops up, and here I am, hi. And you could basically use this malware essentially to do anything. <laughs> Physically watch the person, wiretap audio, upload and download other files, which could be other types of malware. You basically have full system control of the machine. You can basically upload a tool like Windows Credential Editor and get the person's passwords. It doesn't matter. But, but Kevin, isn't yes. this proof, though, that when you are camming for anything, even when you're doing FaceTime, you, someone, can, someone can be capturing that and you have no idea, right? Someone can be recording. That, exactly. Yeah. And they could be watching it in real time. So basically, this is something you don't want on your machine. And when we do a couple more demos today, we're going to install the same malware. I won't have to go through the functionality. But how do you get a target to plug in a USB stick? Do you leave it in the parking lot? Do you mail it in the post with some marketing material? No. You go to the company's Facebook account or, or, or wherever their, their website. You download their logo and you put in red, uh, in red, their company logo, extremely proprietary and confidential payroll salary history, second quarter 2015. <laughs> I promise you somebody will open it. But I got to tell you, Germany, you guys are different. I was staying at the Marriott in Munich to speak at a different uh, conference, and I do this all the time. I'll go to the receptionist or the concierge, and I'll give them a USB stick, and I'll need them to print out my itinerary, so I hand it to the lady at the Marriott in, in Munich. And I say, can you print off something on here? And she goes, I'm sorry, sir. We're not going to plug your USB drive into our computer. <laughs> We're not allowed to do that. <laughs> so the only time I was ever turned down was in Germany. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. So this exploits a bug in the, in the firmware, which you cannot. There's no mitigation. Just don't plug it in. Very insightful and very alarming about how vulnerable we are to exploit. Would you trust it just because it says no malware here? Or should we exercise some due diligence and actually scan it? Well, let's scan it. So what we'll do is we'll right click it. We'll scan for threats. We'll clean it if it is a threat. And as we could see, McAfee antivirus didn't find anything wrong with the PDF. It's clean. So normally what somebody would do is simply double click the PDF and open it. And what's going to happen here, it's going to try to open up the PDF file, but it, it appears that it's frozen. It's not actually frozen, it's actually running the hacker's exploit to take control over your computer. And as you can see, it closed the PDF file, nothing opened, but what happened over here is on the hacker's computer we see a line. And on this line it says that a machine name called infected connected. I'm going to talk about the threat and impact of social engineering. And in 1993, I was living in Denver, Colorado. I was living under the name of Eric Weiss. That happens to be the real name of Harry Houdini. He was my idol. The reason I was living under that name is certain law enforcement agencies were looking for me at the time, and I didn't want them to find me. Uh, so I thought I had a sense of humor of using Harry Houdini's real name. I found out that later that the FBI had no sense of humor. <laughs> Story for another day. So one of my colleagues at the law firm hands me this brochure for the MicroTAC ultralight cell phone. And this was like, this is the MicroTAC. And this is the Star Trek communicator. This right. is like the iPhone 6 of the 1990s. Really? Remember these phones, right? And what I wanted to do is I wanted to get the source code for the firmware in the MicroTAC. Why? Because I was curious of how it worked. I was fascinated with technology, and I wanted to understand the code. So I made a very stupid and regrettable decision to go after the code. So I was, living, I was working at a law firm that day, because I was, uh, had a job, and I asked my supervisor if I could leave a, a, earlier for a doctor appointment. And when I got to the bottom of the building, because it was on a skyscraper, I turned on my cell phone, which, which also wasn't in my name, and I simply call 1-800-DIRECTORY service, directory information. I ask directory assistance for the phone number to Motorola. They give me a phone number, I call it. 
I get a receptionist and I say, hi, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtech Ultralight. And the nice receptionist told me that all cellular phone development from Motorola is handled out of Schaumburg, Illinois. Then she goes, would you like their number? I said, sure. She gives me the number to Schaumburg, Illinois. I call that number. Uh, I get a different receptionist. I say, hey, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtech. I'm transferred to two, three, five. By the eighth or ninth time, I'm transferred around to various people. I'm now talking to the vice president of Motorola Motor Mobility. So the guy that was the vice president of R&D for all of Motorola. And I said the same thing. I said, hey, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. Because during those last transfers, people go, where are you, Arlington Heights? So I picked up on some information. And I said, hey, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtech. And the VP goes, oh, that's Pam. She works for me. Would you like her extension? I said, sure. He gave me the extension. And he goes, can I help you with anything? I go, no, no, no. I'll talk to Pam. So my next call was to Pam. I don't get her, but I get her outgoing reading on her voicemail that she just left on a two-week vacation, the date she was re returning, and if you need any help whatsoever, please call Alicia on extension blah, blah, blah. So who's my next call to? Alicia. I call Alicia, she answers. I go, hi, this is Rick over in Arling Arlington Heights in research and development. I go, did Pam leave on vacation yet? Oh, she has, because before she left, she said she was gonna send me the source code to the microtac, but if she didn't have time, I can call you that you would help me out. And by this time, I'm pressing this, you know, but this is in the 90s, I'm pressing this, you know, big Motorola head, uh, uh, cell phone to my ear and I'm walking down the street. There are cars, you know, horns honking, it's snowing. And uh, I don't want to, obviously I want to, you know, appear that I'm coming from an office, not, you know, walking on the street. And I wasn't expecting the next question. She goes, well, what version do you want? <laughs> and I didn't even look up the version numbers. <laughs> so I go, I go, I was trying to think quickly and I go, how about the latest and the greatest? So I'm walking, and I'm about a 10-minute walk from my apartment, and I hear her typing and typing, and about five minutes later, she goes, I found it, you know. I go, but there's a problem, she says. I go, what's the problem? She goes, there are hundreds of directories, and within each directory, there are hundreds of files. I asked her, I go, do you know how to use tar and gzip? You know, that's like WinZip under Windows where you can archive everything. And she said no. I said, would you like to learn? And she said yes, and I became her instructor. <laughs> and I taught her how to t tar up all the source code. Then my next question to her is, do you know how to use FTP? And she goes, a file transfer program. I go, yes, that's it. So I gave her an IP address of a system I had access to because I couldn't give her a host like hacker at colorado.edu. <laughs> so she tries to open a connection up to the IP address I gave to her and it just timed out. And she tried twice, three times. Then she goes, Rick, I'm gonna to talk to my security manager about what you're asking me to do, I'll be right back. And I go, no, wait, 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 wait. Because <laughs> that's the last person I wanted her to talk to, right? So I'm, again, like now five minutes from my apartment, and I'm, I'm kind of nervous now because she's taking a long time. And I'm worried that she's gonna hook up a recorder to the, uh, to the call, and that's gonna be exhibit A in a court case later. And I was a little bit nervous, so I decided I was going to play a little bit careful when she came back. So a long eight minutes later, she comes back, and she goes, Rick, uh-huh. She goes, that IP address you gave us is outside of Motorola's campus. Uh-huh. And my manager that I just spoke to said, we can't send files outside of Motorola unless we use a special proxy server, and I don't have an account. And I go, uh-huh, and I'm about to hit end on the phone. And she goes, but I have great news for you. I go, what? She goes, my security manager gave me his personal username and password <laughs> to the proxy server so I could send you the file. <laughs> yes. So by the time I could put the key to the front door of my apartment, I had the crown jewels of the Microtech Ultralight. So Motorola, they're a great company. They develop technology. But I think it shows that a person on the other end with a good gift of gab could easily manipulate people in companies to give out information they shouldn't. Shocking to see how quickly he could 
trick people in through social exploits to get them to click on things and get access to a machine. I got the name recognition immediately. Uh, so much so that uh, while I'm in the in the building, you know, I'm just like, uh, you know, I did use the unsecured network. Let me go ahead and change some passwords. As I was doing a pen test of actually a telecommunications provider that had retail outlets all over the states, and so and, and social engineering was in scope. And I called this one retail outlet, which are usually the least secure because you have employees that they're selling products. They're pro they're lower paid. They're not trained as well. So I called this guy up. And I go, hi, this is so-and-so with a corporate, uh, is this store number, blah, blah, blah. He goes, I don't know who you are. I said, I just told you I'm so-and-so with corporate, is a store number. And store number is like a piece of public information, right? So you go in, you know, foot in the door technique is where you ask for simple and public things and then you go in for the kill. It's an it's a, it's a influence technique. So uh, right away you shut me down. And then I go, and he goes, well, I can't give you any information because I don't know who you are. I said, what do you want me to do, fax my passport? You know, I told you I'm with AT&T. Um, I, I just need to get a little bit of information from you, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes, um, he goes, well, have you ever read this book called Art of Deception? <laughs> and I go, no. I go, what is Art of Deception? He goes, it's written by this this guy named Kevin Mitnick, and after reading that book, I'm not giving out any information. <laughs> I shot myself in the foot. When you're dealing with your end users, very hard to make them understand. You really have to be conscious of what you're connecting to, what you're saying okay to. Whew, I think I'm safe, which is more than I can say for some of our attendees in there who just got hacked by Kevin Mitnick, the world's most famous hacker.